Securities offered through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through CWM, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, is under separate ownership from any other named entity. Carson Partners, a division of CWM, LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. This is The Way to Wealth. With host Scott Ford, a jujitsu fighting, woodworking, beekeeping entrepreneur who is also the managing director, partner, and wealth advisor of Carson Wealth. Financial freedom is the goal, and clarity and simplicity is how we'll get there. Let's get to it. This is Way to Wealth. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Way to Wealth podcast, where we're all about making money simple. Super excited today, super excited to have a colleague of mine, Robert Keebler. 2007 was inducted into the Estate Planning Hall of Fame and National Association of Estate Planners and Councils. He's also been named by CPA Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential practitioners, practitioners in the United States and one of the top 40 tax advisors to know during a recession. I'll tell you this, as I was doing due diligence, you know, we work with uh, some of the smartest people, in my opinion, throughout the country. I've always been a believer is, you know, I don't need or want to be the smartest guy in the room, which has never been a challenge for me anyway, but to really find the smartest people out there and surround myself with them. I don't need to have the the, the best answer. Uh, I don't need to be a library. I just want to be a librarian and surround myself with people who are smart and get to the best answer. And so in doing the due diligence with Bob uh, through the years, I had talked to someone I have a lot of confidence in this space. He's a tax attorney, CPA, a really smart guy. And I mentioned that I'd formed a relationship with Bob Keebler. And he's like, oh, oh, Robert Keebler? I'm like, yeah. He's like, ah, that he's a shaman and a god in this tax planning and state planning world. So Anyway, that, that's a pretty strong comment, but it didn't come from me, but super excited to have Bob with us today. So with that, welcome to the Way to Wealth podcast, Bob Keebler. It's good to be here, Scott. Yeah, I appreciate you joining and always like starting uh, with a question, and that is just a little bit of your backstory. Like what got you into the business? You know, what are we doing here today talking about tax, uh, so, such exciting topics of tax and estate planning? Well, everything started fairly normally, accounting degree, master's in tax, CPA exam. And after Price Waterhouse came up here to Green Bay and suddenly just a lot of good tax planning work. And um, over the years, that's just kind of a snowballed. And part of, the, part of that is just, there's a lot of wealth in Green Bay that's kind of hidden well. And as we did more and more speaking, the well, you know, the work started to come from all over the country. And of course, um, one small silver lining of the pandemic for many of us has been that people all across the country are not afraid to get on Zoom calls anymore and work with you. So that that hasn't hurt. So now now we have, you know, for the last 15 years, we've had work from all over the country, but that's been very much accelerated in the last 14 or 15 months. Yeah, yeah, that's no, no doubt. Same for us, for sure. It's uh, really at this point, the world's open for business in a lot of ways because of uh, Zoom. I guess a colleague and guy I know that from Strategic Coach uh, from years ago, and actually I'm still uh, connected with Strategic Coach is Dan Sullivan, and he's he's calling it the, the time tra- transformer, like it's Zoom creates you know, you can, you can be on the other side of the world right now having conversations just like you were there. And so there's some truth to that. And you actually led into to a question I was going to ask at the beginning, Bob, and that is what has the last 18 months shown us regarding tax or estate planning and how we might uh, need to approach it, if anything, as the eight, last 18 months, what has changed uh, your thinking, if any? Well, the first thing we have to confront is we do not know the rules right now. At this nanosecond, we do not know the rules. So the rules are shifting. And it looks like Congress will continue to tinker with the rules um, very much under the current House of Representatives, the current Senate. Remember, the Senate is really controlled by the Democrats because of the, um, the vice president gets to cast the decisive vote. And certainly President Biden himself, all are in favor of shifting more taxes 
to the clients that our listeners typically represent. So that is something that's out there. We have to deal with that realistically. Um, probably greater estate taxes, income taxes at death, higher capital gains rates, higher income tax rates. These are all things that we should expect uh, to come to fruition. What would you view as, and I'm going to give some of my examples, but what do you view as myths or misconceptions when it comes to tax planning? The, I think the first misconception is everyone presumes there's some one single magic bullet that will save everything. For example, um, this just these were all on an IRS hit list in the last 30 days, but um, can, conservation easements. Syndicated conservation easements have been basically, the IRS is very aggressive on that. The Maltese pension plan, you know, the panacea for everybody's woes, uh, the IRS is now looking at that. And clearly the IRS is, go- is staffed by very sophisticated accountants and lawyers. They are going to find the terrible things that some taxpayers are doing, and they're going to stop those. So what works is the, the careful, judicious use of what I call statutory tax shelters. And what that means is Congress has given you a, a shelter, the 401k, the Roth conversion, et cetera. And using many of those simultaneously is going to be what gets you a good result. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And, th- and it ties into what I would say about that, Bob, and that is like myths and misconceptions. I've been doing this since 91, and I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard, where are the loopholes? Like, what can we do to minimize tax and, and uh, uh, find these loopholes? And I say, there are no loopholes. They're writing the code in a certain way. And if we're able, they're telling us what they want us to do basically, is the way the code is written. And as long as you follow what they're telling you that you want, that they want you to do, you might just save tax for that. That's why it's, it's in there. Now it's a substantial code, but the point is, I think the way you look at it can be a misconception. And that's one example that I give. And you, you gave a similar example in that statutory tax shelters, like what does work. The other thing that I, I find to be a, a misconception is pushing too hard for what I'll hear is tax savings now. And I think that words matter. And if we're talking about a deferment, I'm not saying that's bad. Just know that that's not a tax savings. It's a tax postponement, which certainly could benefit you now and in the future. And it might not. So it's just, just, words matter. And so I think that's another myth and misconception that I've heard. What do you, any other thoughts on that? Well, I think it's just a matter of lining up kind of a checklist type, a very disciplined protocol in going through that. And depending where you stand in your tiers, um, we're going to use different techniques to approach that. Yeah. It's such a, yes. And, and, and so everyone knows, I mean, Typically, uh, when you think of our process, the way to wealth, which, you know, of course, the, as you know, the W is an acronym, the wealth is an acronym, the W is what's your foundation. Well, we're talking about today, tax reduction planning, and we're talking about estate planning as well towards the end. So there are two bricks in this foundation. And what Bob's referring to, we've actually done some work together, which we'll share in the show notes of kind of a checklist of how we view things. So we think a tier one with the firm using the way to wealth process is typically people with 500,000 to 2 million of investable assets. Tier two, typically 2 million to 10 million of investable assets. And tier three, 10 million and above, higher net worth. Uh, families and individuals. And a lot of times that 10 million and above are business owners. And there's like these, call them go-to moves, but just a checklist is what Bob is talking about of what should they be considering. And so we'll we'll look at linking that in the show notes. Before we go there, Bob, one of the things I wanted to ask is, what's your view of the difference in tax compliance, doing tax work versus tax strategy? Almost philosophically different. Um, and it, 
almost requires, and I want to be careful how I say this, but very often the people extremely proficient at tax compliance, super detailed orientated, are not going to be, may not rise to the highest level in the world of tax planning because it's almost a left brain, right brain thing. In other words, um, some people are super good in the myopic details and getting everything right. And other people are better able to see the big picture. And what we've seen in the last, I would say, 10 years is a massive shift of some of the basic tax planning work out of the CPA firms into financial planning firms. And Part of the reason that works is because without having the responsibility and the burden of knowing how to do all the compliance work, the financial planners can very generally, I won't say it's easy, but with some effort, learn about itemized deductions and 401k plans and Roth, basic Roth conversions. The, the problem with that is, is that the professions haven't drawn a good enough line of where financial planning stops and where tax work begins. And that's something we all need to work on. It's, I think in medicine, the lines are brighter because so much is at stake. And we just haven't drawn bright lines between financial planning, tax planning, and legal planning. Yeah, that, that might be as clear as I've ever heard that answer, Bob. That's well stated. And it makes me think of two things. I'm talking the compliance versus tax strategy. You mentioning the philosophical difference. And I totally agree with that and get it. And I think of business. A lot of times you have um, visionaries and implementers. So, so for me, I talk about the four P's of business, the purpose, the people, the process, and the profit. That ties in life as well. But the point is a lot of times a visionary is good at setting that purpose and seeing things, the ambiguity and seeing into the future and where things can go and then finding the right people uh, to collectively come in and help implement this. So they're, they're defining, um, they're, they're defining this vision then they're finding who's to help implement the vision. A lot of times people that may implement the vision are more compliance oriented to how to get it done where the visionary is not the how to get it done. It's a really interesting distinction you made and that I've never heard it that way and totally agree with that, that there's a difference between compliance and strategy. And, and it's almost just the makeup of the individual, like your, your given gifts, they're just different and you need, there's not a better, they're, they are both needed. You need a great compliance person a great strategy person, they're just not the same person. And if I would say in tax planning, if what's the biggest gap? To me, it's that because people are trying to find the one person that's the best compliance and strategy. And I think that's a unicorn. There may be a, a handful in the country that can do that, but most are either one or the other. And so it's like you need both on the team. What do you think about that? Well, I, no, I think that's right. And I think what's happened, two things. One is the sheer complexity of the compliance, which is very, very hard, mm. has um, forced people to totally focus on compliance work. And so they, they don't really always have time to see the planning opportunities. And the other thing that's going on out there, this is, this is complex. So we have, we have planning and we have compliance. But it's very possible that, again, people are absorbing too much time on the compliance so they can never get to the planning. And where the financial planners are kind of free of that compliance burden. So I think that that helps in a great way. The other thing that's hurting individual tax compliance are the clients themselves. The I think if you go to the managing partners of the top 300 CPA firms, if they could get rid of all their 1040s, mm. they would love to do that. Because you see, the market of what people will pay for 1040s has just deteriorated so badly. Because you can take 
a reasonably smart person, instead of sending them to school for six years to get a master's in tax, you can send them to school for literally one course, maybe six weeks, and they can do basic tax returns. So you have one person with six years of school and the loans that, that follow who needs to make X number of dollars a year. And you have another person who's thrilled to make 30 or 40% of that. And that person at the bottom set or sets the price in the market. So what happens if you're the managing partner, Scott, you're going to say, you learn about mergers, you learn about LLCs, you learn about S-Corps, you learn about C-Corps, and we'll do those 1040s, but we're not going to spend a ton of time figuring out those strategies because clients very often resist hourly fees for those, especially when the financial planners have become very, very good at kind of the blocking and tackling at the bottom of the market. Yeah, that's a great point. It makes me think of, you know, what I've seen, again, doing this for so long is a couple of things have been patterns. And one is in the industry, professionals typically hear 10, 20, 30, if we're lucky, 40% of the conversation and launch to solution mode. When really you need to get to that last 5% or so to really get to the, the heart of the matter, the real agenda, uh, to be able to make solid planning decisions and I think part of that is exactly what you're saying, because there's too much compliance work in this case or in other areas. They're just overwhelmed. You're just, it, it, and in some ways, like the medical field, you know, you got a certain amount of time because you have so many people to see. And it's like, we need to remedy that where you, you, you should have the space. And, and, and as you said, make those lines bright, because what if someone has 300,000 of investable assets. What if someone has 300 million of investable assets? It doesn't matter. As long as the lines are bright of what services are offered and what the fee for service is for that, what they're going to invest, and those lines are bright, you can make it work. You can make a business model for each. I think people try to do too many things for too many people, and then those lines get blurred, and then the experience ends up not being what it could be and you end up missing areas where you could be saving in taxes, estate tax, et cetera. No, and, and I, I, think that's, I think that's exactly right. And what has to happen is what I constantly hear from financial planners, though, is I put together a plan, brought it to the CPA, and the entire plan got shut down. Yeah. And that is, again... Sometimes that's because the CPA is just difficult or the lawyer is just difficult, but I don't think that's always the case. I think many times it's that the CPA or lawyer just hasn't been exposed to these things there, and there's perceived risk and rather in the CPA or lawyer knows they might not get paid for venturing down that path to fully vet it. So they shut it down early. Yeah. That's a great point. What are your thoughts on this? Because I, I hear this when you hear someone say, or, or you're talking to a CPA and they'll say, um, I'm conservative or, uh, you know, you need to be conservative. You don't want an IRS office. So we're super conservative. We're going to keep you um, clean and out of trouble. Do you hear that as much as I, I say as much as I do? We definitely hear that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of that is very valid because they're trying to keep me out of trouble with my $50,000 clothing donation to Goodwill. Yeah. Um, they're trying to keep me out of trouble with my home office expenses or my mileage on my car. I mean, it's, there's like 10 stupid things taxpayers do. And the IRS is very much aware of these and they will, the IRS will light you up on these things. Yeah. So um, the CPAs know that. Um, hobby losses are a great example. You know, the, the physician um, with six horses that he loses $100,000 a year. On. I'm not talking about betting on horses. I'm talking about right. raising horses. Yes. Um, that is where people get into trouble. Or I represented this gentleman who had fishing boats and he would always lose money on his fleet of fishing boats. Well, in reality, they were to take, so his, he and his large group of friends could all go fishing in a caravan, if you will, you know, quarter mile apart and see who would catch the biggest fish. And 
those kind of things. So um, the IRS is very wise to that. So CPAs are smart to be alert to those things. But it's like, why wouldn't life insurance work as a good tax shelter instead of bonds? Mm -hmm. There's no reason it won't work as long as you have a life insurance professional to figure out what policy is going to give you the best ROI. Does that make sense? Totally. Yes, absolutely. And I think some of this comes for me out. Sometimes I'll start these podcasts with what's your earliest memory of money? And I, and I do that intentionally. And it's because we're patterned. And I think it's part of what we're talking about now. Life insurance is neither good or bad. You can, it, it, none of these moves, 401ks, it's, it's neither good or bad, but we're patterned at a young age. And then as we go through life, we get these imprints that continue on. And then all of a sudden you hear a word and you're triggered and like, oh, this is, this is not, this is no good. Well, is it, or is it just something because you have your mind made up about it? So that's my thought on that. None of this is good or bad. And by the way, there's no panacea either. You mentioned this earlier. There's no one thing that's going to fix everyone's L or one thing that everyone should have. It's like, okay, let's look at all the options and explore you. And then let's really get to know you and what you're trying to do. And those words are said so often that it can be meaningless to just hear what I said. That to me is one of the biggest missing elements is getting super clear on what you're trying to accomplish, who you are, what goals, objectives are, what pain points are. I mean, really clear. Then bring in people like Bob who are super smart and have all kinds of options that are out there understanding the code. Once we're really clear on what you're trying to accomplish, what you like, don't like, and what your pain points are. So, a couple questions I had. Do you have examples where you've seen tax planning done poorly and or tax planning done well, either one that through through your experience? Well, on the poor side, I'm, I'm handling an IRS audit right now with a syndicated conservation easement. Um, that is an example of really poor planning. Hmm. Um, on the other hand, I have some gift tax returns that are being audited and those will fly through with very little changes. And that's an example of just good, prudent wealth transfer planning. Yeah. That's but you great. have to avoid those listed transactions and those syndicated shelters because um, they're generally going to put you in a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. And the government's trying to close some of that down with by getting injunctions. But it's, um, if you remember the game Whack-A-Mole? Yes. It's like that. I mean, as soon as they close one down, another pops up because there's always someone that believes in their heart of hearts that this works. They've been convinced that it works. Yeah. It's just not as fun as whack-a-mole. That's the only thing. It's not as fun, right? <laughs> whack-a-mole is fun. So what about, what about the whole thing with way to wealth is about making money simple. Um, from your vantage point, can tax planning be made simple? I think so. I, I think you look at, building blocks of how do we shelter interest income? How do we shelter dividends? How do we shelter capital gains? And really I've done those uh, tax buckets for many years. And I think with that, if you had that sheet and somebody to help you, I could drop you anywhere on the planet. And if you had a CPA and lawyer from that country to explained you their tax system, you would be able to apply that chart to see which techniques work under a particular body of law. So it's not so much, um, you have to have a detailed knowledge of the code, of course, but it's just a matter of where do we get shelter? Where, where does Congress or where does a legislature give you tax shelter? Again, coming back to those statutory tax shelters. Yeah. And on that note, if, if you're okay with it, Bob, we'll, we have some of those that we've received from you and work with you uh, in the past. I could share some of this in the show notes so that of people course. Know what we're talking about. So thank you. We'll do that. Uh, so those listeners can see exactly what Bob's talking about. And, you know, uh, where do you fall in there? And you want to use it with your current professional? Fantastic. It'll just give you a starting point. And yeah, making this simple is where it's, where it's at. So I mentioned really, typically where we work and, and, and usually people 500,000 to 2 million, 2 million and up to 10 million, 10 million and up. 
when you think of the 500,000 to 2 million, you got a listener out there, 750,000 uh, married kids, grandkids, what are some things they could be thinking about when it comes to tax planning? From 500,000 up, it's 401ks and pension plans, putting generally everything you can away. IRA contributions, Roth contributions and Roth conversions, charitable strategies, maybe itemizing deductions every other year, low turnover investments, and then using donor advised funds to facilitate your charitable giving. That, I mean, we can go a little bit beyond that, but that is the heart. If I met with a young couple, 30 years old, um, both you know, college educated with good incomes, those would be the things I'd have them focus on. That's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. And again, we'll include this in notes. What about um, people 2 million, uh, yeah, 2 million to 10 million typically investable assets? What are some options for folks in that range? It's kind of the same list, the blocking and tackling, but you might add on to that. These are sophisticated. You got to be careful that people understand. You might add on to that real estate, life insurance, solar, oil and gas. If they have a business, make sure they're doing everything to qualify for 199 Cap A. Those would be the things I would tear on to that. Got it. And then when you think of 10 million and up, um, that, that's typically what we see. I would assume same as before, including what you just added, real estate, life insurance, solar, oil, gas, 199A, if they're a business, what additional things would be uh, considerations for that 10 million and up investable assets? People. Probably charitable remainder trusts, maybe private foundations, locking in on their estate planning to make sure they're headed in the right direction on their estate planning, looking at whether charitable lead trusts will do anything for them, and then looking at state, S-T-A-T-E, state income tax planning, in sometimes a state like Minnesota, for example, or California, will allow you to create a trust out of state. In other words, a California resident today in 2021 can create a trust in Wyoming or Nevada and enjoy not having to pay California tax on the earnings of that trust if they do it right. Mm. Yeah, helpful. And, and, and when it comes to, you know, now you're getting into the 10 million and up. So, and certainly with potential change in the estate tax law, uh, estate tax and asset protection need considered uh, for folks, maybe even lower than that, but certainly 10 million and above. What are some things to think about there uh, for folks listening in that category, estate planning and asset protection? Well, the, the asset protection work should probably be done by a lawyer under the lawyer's privilege because Again, creditors um, are going to start deposing people, and it's, it's better if some of those conversations are privileged. But basic asset protection involves a person putting money in an IRA, putting money in their pension plan, having adequate umbrella policies. So what does that mean? Is that $5 million, $8 million, $10 million, $15 million? But it's you want to have a large umbrella policy, Scott, so that when something goes wrong, the insurance company sends a very sophisticated lawyer with lots of gray hair. Somebody that's, you know, really knows how to defend this particular liability. And, but if the insurance company has five or $8 million on the line, you can be sure that, you know, they're going to send their starter. They're not going to send their third or fourth, um, pitch her in. They're, they're going to send the best they have. Okay? Yes. And that's that's what really, so you're buying two things. You're buying the $8 million of coverage or $10 million of coverage, plus you're buying the lawyer that the insurance company wants to defend that. Yeah. That, that's very important. Now, when you go to a more sophisticated level, attorneys like Steve Oceans will tell you to create trusts, to put property in trusts with discretionary provisions. Um, they'll tell you to get prenuptial agreements and maybe use LLCs where uh, you can only get a charging order against the LLC, not the LLC itself. If you have um, 
50 different apartment buildings, maybe you should not have them all in one LLC, but spread them across 10 different LLCs. Compartmentalize your wealth. And so there's um, very important for people to do use insurance and then to do basically outside in asset protection planning where you protect your assets from the outside world, but then you need to do what people call inside out asset protection. That is where I wrap a, a, a business. If I have 50 dry cleaners, I might have 50 different LLCs if I can deal with the complexity from an accounting perspective um, so that if something goes wrong, one problem doesn't wipe out my whole business. Mm. Yeah, that's good and helpful. And when I think of the insurance piece, I, I started in this the industry in insurance. And so I kind of got a disdain. I've come a little bit full circle there in specific type, but in one area we're talking about it, and that is liability coverage. My answer to that question personally is how much liability, as much as you can, meaning how much will the, ins I start with what will they give me? Because they're, they're not in the business. They won't over-insure. They're going to give you what you're exposed for, or that, that's where they start. They're not going to, not going to get too much life insurance. It's based on something too much uh, umbrella. So I start there. And if affordable, I want to not worry about the minuscule, but the catastrophic, I want to make sure that you're, I'm covered. So that's my starting point on the asset protection. And you were, you were kind of, I think, speaking to that. And then you mentioned with the asset protection lawyer, I love the outside in and inside out uh, thought process there. So yeah, super helpful. So those listening, Bob, really um, last question that I have would be questions for listeners when they're working with um, a CPA firm or getting tax advice or compliance work, what questions should they be asking uh, professionals that they're either working with or potential professionals that they may work with? I think it's, um, are they at all process orientated? Do they have a, a checklist they can go through? You know, how do they approach the tax planning? Mm. Because a lot of times it's just, it's not as process driven as you'd like it to be. Mm. Um, somebody looks at your tax return and says, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. I like to approach it just, these are the hundred things that are possible. These will go through the checklist. These 14 fit you and we'll figure out how to implement these 14. Yeah, that's great. That's helpful information. Uh, I'm biased, but I'm going to say it. And that is, that's the design of the way to wealth. That's why we get along and like Bob is process oriented. And when you think about it, it's back to the four P's to me, purpose, people, process, and profit. Once you got the purpose, you got the right people. What's the process? Well, ours is the way to wealth. And you know it. And part of that is tax planning and estate planning. And that's where people like Bob come in. How would they find out more information about you and some of your work? What would be the best way to uh, engage with you there? Well, anyone's certainly welcome to just uh, look our firm up at keeblerandassociates.com and you're, you're welcome to shoot us an email and uh, we'll, we'll try to help you. Yeah, that's fantastic. As usual, great information, Bob. Thanks for joining. Hopefully we'll have you on uh, down the road in the future with some additional insights and wisdom. And listeners, thanks for joining again this week. Uh, the Way to Wealth podcast, where we're all about making money simple, allowing you to focus fully on living now. See you next week. See you soon. Thanks. The opinions voiced in Way to Wealth with Scott Ford, Managing Director, Partner, and Wealth Advisor of Carson Wealth, are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial, or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Way to Wealth are not affiliated with CWM LLC or Satara Advisor Networks LLC. Carson Wealth, 19833, Leitersburg Pike, Suite 1, Hagerstown, Maryland, 21742.